These are the Dragons, five of Britain's most enterprising and wealthy business people. Having each built up their multi-million pound fortunes from scratch, they spent the summer making and breaking the dreams of dozens of budding businessmen and women. Aspiring entrepreneurs applied in their thousands to face the Dragons, and despite challenging economic times, they deemed a record 17 businesses worthy of investment. They've been amazed. Yeah, baby! What a great deal! And dismayed. The problem is, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a <laughs> You are completely dysfunctional when it comes to understanding how to launch a business. But then they made the deals that have changed lives. We can't wait to make you a multimillionaire, Christopher. Now, with the den closed for business, the dragons are returning to their multi-million pound empires. Each week, we're joining one dragon as they push ahead with their investments. Catch up with some of those who didn't get the cash. How many have you sold? I think one box. One box? One box. Does that worry you? No. no. It would worry me. And gain a rare insight into what the fearsome investors get up to outside the den. I am the boss. 30 <laughs> points. Of course, you are the winner. Thank you. Tonight, James Kahn. When the den doors closed, what happened next? You know what you need to do? Let's get this show on the road. Excellent. James Kahn arrived in style in 2007. The market's about animals, dogs and treadmills. In the den, he's offered nearly one and a quarter million pounds of investment. He's clearly a very good investor. He homes straight in on the numbers. I'm not sure I'd get a return in my lifetime, and I'm looking for a bit quicker than that, really. James is definitely obsessive about the calculation and valuation of the business. I just want to understand the financial model. From July to June of this year, you've turned over how much? And what have you got as booked revenue for the next six months in your projection for this year? OK, how much cash do you have in the bank? He's a numbers man. So what is his investment technique? We don't know. He wouldn't tell us. James is hard to read. You can't always tell when he's angry, cos he's got this mask on. Every one of those factors that you use to get a valuation of four million, you have not delivered against, correct or not. Do you know the only way of telling that James is really angry is when James says, I'm really angry? If I come to make business investments, and this, for me, has zero credibility, the type of thing that can get James very angry is certainly people overvaluing their businesses. So you're proposing me a business with a turnover of £700 that you're valuing at £1 million. But James is never upset for long. He's always got the love of his life to cheer him up. The man and his phone, you know, rarely parted. He turns up in the morning and he's chattering into his phone. Has his makeup chattering into his phone. Speak to him later. Bodyguards have to remove it from him when we start filming in the den. James, may I steal your phone? Uh, and I can't turn it off. I mean, it's, it's connected to me. He may be cutting edge when it comes to phone technology, but in other areas, he's rooted firmly in the 80s. He dresses very, very strangely. It's kind of like Miami Vice. I think James has learnt to be quite particular now about his appearance. When he first came in, he was open neck shirt, bit of an unkept beard. He wasn't the James that we see today, the clean cut image, the very smart suit. I'm not used to doing this much work first thing in the morning. Could have made a fortune by now. He's basically copied me, let's be honest. It was a style of a different era that caught James's eye earlier this year. Londoners Gary Hillman and Faisal Khan wanted to give the world's smallest production car a new lease of life, needing an £80,000 investment for a 10% stake. Whilst on a family holiday in Florida, I went into a place called Ripley's, believe it or not, who have all the world records in their museums, and I noticed they didn't have any cars. Very soon, we had an order for two cars at £15,000 each. 
This gives us the opportunity of 15 million paying customers seeing our cars, therefore an, an, an extraordinary opportunity to sell toys. I don't think it's just the toys. You know, we can develop the brand further to have ball games, remote control, and also uh, could form a character. The replica life-size models of the classic Peel cars were an immediate hit with the Dragons. Yeah. We've got space for one more. How the hell did you get this? <laughs> when they actually got in the cars, driving around, everyone's having fun. And you see them enjoying themselves, it makes you feel comfortable. <laughs> Bit of a sort of full storm, feeling comfortable. They're all happy, you think you've cracked it, and then the questions start coming. <laughs> you want to create board games? remote controls. Give me an idea how you're going to do that. We're saying that the, the, the brand could be from matchbox toys to remote control toys, a lot of variations. Tell me about the remote control. What's the remote control idea? Well, just a remote control car. We were accused of not having a business plan. And no, we didn't have a business plan going into the den. Guys, can I say, you run the risk of coming across to me as completely half-cocked. Please tell me you've got a business proposition. Maybe, yeah, we could have uh, put a plan together, but we were more thinking about, you know, what we're going to do once we've got a dragon on board, you know, dreaming further on down the line than actually the, uh, the nitty-gritties of a, of, a, of a plan. Normally, people come and say, we've got these cars, legacy of the 1960s, we've sold 20, we've got a massive marketing activity going all over the world. We've got Ripley's, they're really keen on it, they're spending this amount of money, we're making £10,000 a car. That is going to generate us £120,000. With your extra £80,000, that gives us £200,000. And we've arranged with a toy distributor to manufacture these products. Coming into the den without a credible plan is a surefire way of attracting a dragon's ire. But Peter Jones also set about giving the duo a masterclass in den pitching technique. Peter Jones, there's my money. Thank you. <laughs> well, that's why he's sitting there and we're standing here. This is about as half-baked a pitch, which well, isn't really a pitch, it's a bit of fun. It certainly isn't a business investment. So for that reason, I'm out. Unfortunately for Gary and Faisal, three more dragons followed Deborah by walking away from the deal. Only James remained. Had he spotted an opportunity where his rivals had not? Four dragons out. Last chance saloon. James Khan hasn't said a word to us yet. Like the old saying goes, perhaps, no news is good news. Guys, tell me about this Ripley's contract. So, so far, they've bought how many? They've bought 14 in total, so far. OK, and your instinct is, over the next 12 months, what's your gut feeling as to what you think they're going to buy? Another 12. It was definitely a relief to hear that, you know what, there's someone of these five that see what we see, that believe what we believe. I also understand that, you know, and you've been quite upfront, you say, we don't know, because maybe a dragon can help us. Immediately, I thought, he's grasped it. It was, you're feeling more and more comfortable, more and more confident, and then the magic words. I'll tell you what I'm going to do, guys, I'm going to make you an offer. I'll offer you the £80,000, I'd want 50%. Yeah. Can we have a moment? Sure. I don't think we could have done the deal at 50%. No, just I don't think couldn't we could have done it. No. no, because obviously me and Fires were 50 50. And if he takes 50, we're only 25 25. Is it worth doing it, basically? You know, so, yeah. he'll, so. he'll have complete control of our yeah. company. What we'd like to do is offer you from our stock of eight cars, one of each of the models, and 30% of our company. And if in two years' time we don't make £80,000, we give you the money back and you keep the cars. When they came back with the counter-offer, I must admit, it did put a smile on my face, because it's what we call in the trade, it's a very technical phrase, it's called a no-brainer. The only thing I could think of, the only phrase that was screaming in my head was, you've got yourself a deal, guys. <laughs> Good. It's the world's smallest car. There's so many directions we can go in right now.
James could see that there is something here which could be a big thing that we just need to develop. Faisal and Gary left the den with that all-important offer. But before a deal is actually signed, a rigorous period of due diligence follows. You all right? Yes. Yes. The business plan going forward will be based not only on the sale of the vehicle, but the merchandising around it. And there's no better place to start than the museum where the vehicles are on display. Well, here they are, Faisal. There they are. <laughs> Looks so we came to see. <laughs> This guy makes Peter Jones look uh, a pipsqueak now. Yes, yeah. Oh, they've done us proud. Yeah, excellent. That's superb. This has started the ball rolling. Uh, the first deal was two cars, then 14. Got another two cars. We're negotiating now with various cars to make sure they're in they're in all their 74 locations throughout the world. So, as I say, it's a, it's a big part of our business plan. Drive the steering wheel, then, yeah. Press that button on the bottom and drive it, yeah? The example here is exactly why toys need to be made of this car. <laughs> Kids are going to come along, even the parents, they love the car, they love the experience they have with the car, and they're going to want to, and they're going to, want to take a little piece of this experience home with them to remember. What better way to do that than a toy car? But there's work to do to get the toys on the shelves and to fully realise the opportunity the brand can offer. Today, James is at Gary and Faisal's Lewisham HQ to get an update on how the plans of his new business partners are progressing. Hi, James. Oh, yeah. Good to see you, okay, Gary. OK. One of the things that is important, I think, when you came into the den, one of the things that I made, you know, quite clear that the one I'd like to see is a proper business plan. That... Well, work in progress. I mean, if, if we're honest, where we are now is we've got so many different... Um, opportunities mm. um, and obviously there are it is just myself and Gary so it's about working smart mm. hopefully as soon as we do a deal with a big worldwide retail chain or, or organization you can therefore develop the business plan a, a bit further this is really exciting and already you know in a space of a couple of weeks I think we've generated a lot of excitement yeah. um, so I think you absolutely need to focus and make sure that that business plan you know, you've got to prioritise on that. And until that point, I'm totally happy to continue, you know, working with you, you know, in an advisory capacity, because I want to see this work. Yeah. You know, are you, are you comfortable with that? Yeah, absolutely. With the deal a step closer, James is a step closer to playing a full part in the future of Peel. Wow. Helping breathe life back into the brand that ceased trading 36 years ago. So what do we got here? This is like a... My little toy store. Is that, so the is that actually the original? Original. Yeah, oh, wow. Originals, yeah. They're each worth approximately under thousand pound each. The duo may now own the original name, but they share the design with a faithful community of enthusiasts. We don't want to distance ourselves from the Isle of Man. We've, we've just obviously started the venture, and it's, we feel it's very important that to remember the history, the Isle of Man, and the British connection. It's very important for us to keep this British, and obviously, what we want to make sure is that we now continue um, to, to put this brand in its rightful place, which is on the you know the world the world stage. I think it was a really good visit. You know, I think they probably need to do a bit more work as far as the business plan is concerned. They're not quite there yet, but I'm confident. I mean, you know, they're committed, they want to do it, they're really determined. In the meantime, I'm going to continue to support them with their business as an advisor to ensure that they've got every opportunity of getting this business plan crystallised. It's fair to say that whether big or small, James Kahn and cars go hand in hand, and his family have inherited his passion. Today, on one of his rare days away from the business, he and his wife Aisha are taking their daughters to test drive a new 4x4. We need to get a test drive, and then when I see what you can do with it, I'll then reflect on whether... To buy it. Whether... Am I in or am out. I out? You're in. You're <laughs> on... Gemma, really push it, darling. Push it to the limit. Drive carefully. No, don't drive carefully. James is used to taking risks in business. Oh, my 
gosh, here we go. Oh my gosh. And that risk-taking mentality seems to have rubbed off on Hannah and Gemma. I think when you watch them as they're driving around, I think one of the things that's really lovely is that they, they get on really well. They're almost inseparable. They socialise together, they have friends together. Oh! I don't think, personally, that they are spoiled. You have your moments, James. I do you enjoy, do have your moments I do enjoy them. spoiling them a bit. And I think, you know, as a dad and, you know, dad with these girls, you know, and they say, Dad, can I, can I have this? Oh, what, what can I do? What can I say? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm a bit soft like that. James may be soft when it comes to his girls. <gasps> not just creep oh, it down. Oh, my oh, God. Oh, my God. But he is certainly not soft when it comes to business. So just where does he draw his strength from? To be successful, I think it is absolutely essential that you have that sense of security in your life. And I think my success, you know, really started when I first met Aisha. James works very hard, but when he walks through the front door, he's all mine. And I make sure that he's not even on the mobile phone when he walks through the front door. You make all the decisions on the other side of the front door, and I make all the decisions on this side of the and front I, door. You know what? And I think it works amazingly it well. You know why that is, Danny? Because we're best friends. No, bestest. Bestest friends, that's yeah. why. Yeah. Thank you. There's, it would be a dream come true, but unfortunately, we need to see this through according to our own vision. I think it's the wrong decision, but good luck anyway. OK, thank you very much. It's a rare event when entrepreneurs who get an offer of investment in the den... Thank you so much. But we're going to stick to our guns. ..decide to turn it down. My answer, unfortunately, is, is no. OK, um, well, on that basis, then, I'm out. And I'm withdrawing the offer, so no I'm out too. Paul Ward surprised everyone in 2009 when he was looking for £100,000 in exchange for 5% of his range of superbug-killing cleaning products. On the first year of trade, on the laundry detergent side, we'll do about £1 million worth of business and a net profit of £250,000. We believe in year two, we'll do £2.5 million with a net profit of £500,000. And in year three, four million with a net profit of 750,000 pounds. Any questions? The timely range of cleaning products meant Paul had benefited from last year's swine flu epidemic. It led to the ambitious forecast he hoped would entice the dragons to part with both their cash and their experience of getting product onto the retail shelves. I thought Paul came in really confident. He obviously had a product he was really proud of, He'd found a market for it. And you can always tell when they talk about their numbers, there's an air of confidence about, you know, I think I've got a winner here. We also manufacture sort of like alcohol gels for, for hospitals, 70% alcohol. You know, like you go in a hospital and you get the, the alcohol gel there. And the, the swine flea that we've got at the moment has been fantastic for our business. I was confident in my valuations because I knew what my business was doing at the time. Bear in mind, before I went under it, there was two years of getting it tested in laboratories, proving the product actually worked. And I knew once I had that, I could go to market and the product would be well received. The witness entrepreneur's confidence in his product was apparent to all the multi-millionaire investors. But he had offered only 5% equity in the company, one of the smallest offered in the den. It was a real concern for all the dragons. How much equity are you prepared to give away then for 100,000? Well, I, I, you know, um... Do you own 100% of the company? 50% of the company. And who owns the other 50%? Uh, Kath Brown, she's my business partner. Are you able to make a decision? Yeah, yeah. At what level? They've told me to, to, to try and negotiate 5%. 5% or nothing? 5%. Uh, um, see whether you get... Would, would you get any interest on 5%? Would you get any interest on 5%? This is not an auction. I, I know that, yeah. It's, sorry, it's a flippant way to say it. I didn't, I didn't mean so it. So did they say, whatever you do, Paul, don't give away more than 5%. If they offer you, ask for anything else, walk. 
Yeah, basically. I thought 5% was what the company was worth. And obviously I, I had my business partner, Calf, in the back of my head saying, if they go for 10%, 20%, just say no, walk away. I cannot believe that Paul came into the den and would not budge on 5% equity. I don't know where he thinks he was or what he thinks he was doing, but 5%, you've got to be kidding. You can't come into my den and ask and just sit tight on 5% equity. But everything that you've said doesn't match your intention. Mm -hmm. And to come back and say, you'll go for a range between 5 and 10, valuing your company anywhere between 1 and 2 million is a bit of a joke, actually. And I don't think you deserve any more time from me. Okay. So, on that basis, I'm out. Paul's inflexibility on equity had infuriated the Dragons, and four of them declared themselves out. The funny part is, when all of the Dragons went out in a flash, I looked to my right. Oh, no, James is still in. When all the other Dragons in succession are declaring themselves out, it's giving me a chance to sort of reflect and say, you know what, actually, if you really believe in those numbers, because that's what you're holding on to your 5%, then fantastic. So I thought, what I should probably do here is give him the opportunity to put his money where his mouth is. I really like it, Paul. So i tell you what I'd like to do, Paul. I'll offer you the full £100,000. I'd like 30% of the business, but I would like to give you back 10% for each year that you deliver what you said to me you can deliver. OK. OK. Can I just have a...? Yeah, of course you can. Do you want to go...? Yeah, thanks a lot, yeah. When James was making me an offer, it was a bit of relief. It was a good offer. But I just thought, well, I'm still giving 30% of my business away, like, you know, at the start. Because I don't know what having a dragon on board was going to bring. I just felt, at that time, 30% was way too much. OK. James, um, it is a good offer. Um, but I just think, at this stage in the business, I just can't take that offer. Um, but I'd like to say thanks for making the offer to me. I'm the driving force with this. I've developed this, you know. This is my life for the last couple of years. And for me to give 30% of my... It's just not doable, so... I would like Even to... though you get it back? Even though I get it back. Well, then I'll declare myself out. Thanks a lot. I think having made him the offer and giving him the opportunity to almost have it his way, for him to still show that degree of inflexibility, immediately I realised why all the other dragons clearly got so frustrated because that's not how you do business. Twelve months on, and Paul is back in his office in the northwest. But how has business been without the dragon he turned down in the den? Last year, when we went on to the den, there was just me, Kath and Ken in the business. Uh, since then, my brother Andrew has joined in to sort of, like, generate PR and design the website for us. Upon leaving the den, Paul and his business partner subcontracted production. He says that to meet delivery of the 1.2 million bottles they sold this year, they had no option but to move from their original small factory operation. So now the filling, packaging and distribution of his cleaning products are handled by a specialist manufacturing firm. The car side of the business is doing very, very well at the moment. We've just got an opportunity to present the product to the rapid review panel, which is part of the NHS, where they look at the product scientifically to see whether it's good enough for the NHS. And because of that, we're already supplying small scale into the NHS at the moment, but it's growing very, very rapidly, so we think full scale will be in the NHS probably by the end of the year. So the commercial side of business is flourishing, but what about the bug-killing detergents for the home market, the retail side? Retail has been a stumbling block because we normally supply direct into the trade. We went on the Dragon's Den to get into retail, I think we wanted the dragons on board, it would have happened a lot quicker. It's here in Paddington that Paul's product is making its first step onto the shelves. He's introducing a specialist range of sportswear laundry detergent into the sports retailers. 
James has not forgotten about being rejected in the den, but in the end, would it have been worth accepting the 5% equity share that Paul offered? What I'm really excited about today is I'd like to know, so did Paul actually hit or deliver the numbers that he presented in the den? Hiya, Paul. It's been a long time. That's right, yeah, it has, yeah. How have you been? They're fine, right? I thought I'd come along and see you today, Paul, because um, I said, look, I'm happy to come all the way down to 10% mm -hmm. if you do the numbers. So the $64 million question, Paul, is have you hit your numbers? Uh, we did, actually, yeah. Turnover in the last financial year was £1.5 million, but retail has made up only 5% of that figure. With hindsight, it would have been great to have your on board and looking back on it, maybe, you know, I, I should have had a different train of thought, but obviously I was minded, obviously, to make sure my business partner's happy as well. It's tell not me just so, me in the business. I understand. Tell me, Paul, how, how much have you been able to penetrate the retail sector? How's it working? I mean, have you got any products in this store? Yeah, yeah, we have, yeah. Show yeah. me what we've got. This is the products in the shops. It's a unique product in the sports detergent market. In the last 12 months, obviously, we've done a lot more trial and development with the products. We've had loads of the testimonials, people coming back in and saying, the product's fantastic, it actually works. And we've got Olympic athletes now who have used it, who are endorsing the product on the run-up to the Olympics. So we made up to actually see it on the shelf, finally. Obviously, it was a lot harder to do it ourselves with you, without you on board, but ultimately, we got there eventually. So, James has heard the update on the business. Should he have accepted Paul's 5% equity offer to get the deal? Paul, the mere fact that I made you an offer, as far as I'm concerned, tells me very keen on the business, very keen on you, and at the moment I think you've got some great ambitions, but you're still running the business as a bit of a boutique. Mm -hmm. I think to be big, you've got to think big. And I suppose when I was driving here today, the thing that was crossing my mind is, is this the one I want to recapture? And listening to you now and just hearing the, your story, I think this is the one I want back, Paul. <laughs> right. It's broke my heart once before, <laughs> Paul. All I can say is, don't do it again. Well, I think, obviously, I think there's a deal that we could probably strike up. My business partner, she's got to a stage in her life where she wants to retire. So I'd like to feel I'm in a stronger position now to get you on board and feel comfortable about having you on board. What I want to do is be part of that journey with you, Paul. And I think if your partner now has got to a situation where she wants to retire, that just leaves that clear... There's a vacancy, Paul. I think it was great to meet up again, and I'm really glad we did this, because I think it's given me an opportunity to kind of recapture the moments in the den. But I would like to follow it up and I would like to meet you and Kat. So, on that basis, why don't you give me a call and we'll take it from there. Yeah, okay, James, thanks. Yep. Great to see you, mate. Let's go. Yeah. James and Paul are in talks about a potential investment, but as yet, no deal has been agreed. There's no question. I think Paul is definitely investable, and I think his product is obviously clearly doing really well. If we can get him into the major high streets, this could be a multi-million pound business, no question. That was all a bit surprising, to be honest. I think the strong point was that we met all our financial targets, which we said we were going to do. We proved that we've got a good business. So I think it, it would be, at this point, James will be an asset to the business. Come on, guys, we need to get back on those phones. Still to come. James Kahn mixes business with pleasure. When you're investing in the den, I think it's really important that it's a product that you actually like yourself. A deal spawns future dragon material. I'm just really pleased that I stuck to my core principles, which is I back people. Okay. And he returns to his business roots. On the phones, £20,000 worth of business. Yes, still got it. <laughs> James Kahn has made 35 appearances since he entered the den in 2007. I was just checking to see if I had any money left, actually. I was just checking my account. He's turned down hundreds of entrepreneurs in that time. I'm out. I'm out. I don't understand what you're saying, James. Stan, what do you think I'm saying, Stan? You're out. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'll tell you what I'm going to do, guys. I'm going to make you an offer. But he has shaken hands on 18 business deals. We have a deal. Dennis! Fantastic! One of James's earliest was back in Series 5, much to the amusement of the other dragons. It's... Sorry, I love your dog. He's leaning very casually with He's so laid back. <laughs> Look at him. But Sammy French is having the last laugh. Would like to accept your offer. What on, James? She and James now say they are turning over half a million pounds this year. A year after the treadmill came Janice Dalton, Simeon Salik and Dominic Lawrence with their temporary blinds. I think we got ourselves a deal. In the months following the den, James needed to give them a lesson in sales. So I want this man on the phone every day, smiling and dialing, and we want to hear those chickings. Dominic, well, it seems to have worked. The team are heading towards realising year two targets of £150,000 turnover. In the same year, James joined forces with Duncan again, this time in an innovative new cable tie design. I shall take you up on that offer. Andrew Harsley says that demand in the last six months has quadrupled. His £160,000 six-month profit is being ploughed straight into three new production lines. And earlier this year, Ian Taylor became the last entrepreneur to walk up the den stairs, hoping to get a dragon on board. He wanted an £80,000 cash injection in exchange for 25% of his company, providing mobile video advertising that reaches the customers that fixed billboards can't. When Ian unveiled the bike, I honestly thought, wow. And, you know, when you're investing in the den, I think it's really important that... It's a product that you actually like yourself. As you can see, the screens can be used for many, many different applications, using it for helping with recruitment for the army. And in towns and city centres, the screen in its lowest position, assisting advertisers to, and, and, in this case, a police force to get the message across. I prepared for the den by making sure that I understood the business and I'd spent a lot of time making sure that when I went in there I'd got my pitch right and I'd done my homework. The fourth year's revenue comes to 365,000 yep. and the last year's revenue was 352,000. Okay and if I gave you the 80,000 pounds you're looking for how do those numbers change? Those numbers change because I would plan to do two things. I would plan to add additional inventory. I'd plan to put a new vehicle or a vehicle in the south, or maybe have one in the north and two in the south, and a sales team. I think Ian started off really well. He handled the barrage of questions, and then I think Deborah particularly unraveled an element of his business that, that really started to show some real flaws. Are you actually running profitably at the moment? We're running pretty much at break-even, but by the end of this financial year, we're on track to make a profit. So what profit do you think you're going to make? From January this year to December this year, 40,000. But you're nearly at the end of the year, you're breaking even. Right. So how are you going to make profit of 40,000? You know, he was good and everybody thought he was credible and there was loads of stuff going right for him. But sometimes there's just something is not right. The year we're in at the moment, I don't know if I'm, I don't think I'm being obtuse here. The year we're in at the moment, I don't get how you get to £40,000 profit. It may, it may well be that the figure of 40000 is my goal for, to achieve. Um, do you know why stop at 40,000? Why don't you have a goal at 250,000? Your goal isn't really what I'm asking. What do you profit do you think you're going to make this year? Deborah had indeed discovered a flaw in Ian's pitch. He could not support his projections of year-end profitability, a cause of concern for the millionaire investors. When I went into the den, I was aware that I'd been trading five years and that the revenue and the profits for that period would be exposed. I went into the den to look for investment so we could increase the profits. Dragons don't always expect instant returns from potential investees, but they do expect a clear path to reaching profitability. Theo Pafitis had listened to Ian's business plan and wasn't impressed. The model as you've got it at the moment doesn't work. It doesn't work, you're right. I just can't see a way that if I invested anything in you, all that we're doing is assisting you 
in making a living for a longer period before you run out of money again. For that reason, then, I'm out. Thank you. Theo Pafitis' concerns about profitability had prompted him to go out, and three of his rival dragons quickly followed. Ian's hopes rested on the one remaining investor. I lost four dragons. They may have appeared to most in quick succession, but I had a, a hunch or a gut feeling that James was very interested. And the fact that it hadn't declared him out in the very early stages, that it had some initial questions, made me feel that he was staying until the end. And I had to just convince him to, to make me an offer. This business is my children's inheritance. I am determined to make it a success. I would like to make it a success with you, with your money and your help. But I will make this business a success. I'm determined to do that. Sometimes you have to give somebody the benefit of the doubt. Now, although Deborah wasn't convinced and nor was Theo, but at the end of the day, I'm not investing in Deborah. I'm not investing in Theo. I'm investing in Ian. It's his business. So I'm going to make you an offer, Ian. Thank you. I'm going to offer you the full amount of £80,000. I'd like to propose an equity stake of 45%. If you achieve the forecast for each year you achieve that number, I'm happy to give you 10% back. When James came out with the initial percentages, they were significantly higher than I'd anticipated going to. Um, I think that in my mind, I initially thought maybe I might go to 35% before I walk away. Would you take uh, an offer of 40% if I exceed uh, year one's target, year two ta target, and reduce it by 7.5% per year? I'm sorry, and the reason why you're doing that, Ian, is because... I'm negotiating. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> I will still want 45%, mm -hmm. but I'll drop to 40% if your year-end numbers achieve 40,000 profit. I'll accept your offer, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you I felt with the, all of the dragons I could have worked with them, but James in particular, I, I, I felt that I was on his wavelength. I wasn't expecting an easy ride when I went into the den. Um, I got a relatively tough time, but I felt that, you know, James was on board with the bikes and the digivans. It's five months since the den, and Ian is busy at home in Wakefield, where his company was conceived. Following the den, we had an unbelievable amount of people saying, well done, congratulations. About 11 o'clock in the evening, decided that I needed a glass of wine because I was finding it really difficult to communicate to people on Twitter, Facebook. Ian had got some well-earned recognition for all the hard work he had done, but he had worked tirelessly for six years to get his business into the shape the dragon saw in the den. The first bike took an infinite amount of time to put together. Uh, there was a lot of trials and tribulations at what should go where, and after we prepared or got rid the first bite ready, the second bite was a piece of cake. And I spent a lot of very late nights in here in freezing cold weather. I could have been doing other things, but this is where I was. And I really didn't want to be here, but I had a dream of creating a, a digibike. Today, Ian and his son Ryan are on the beat in Leeds. A van and a digibike have been booked by West Yorkshire Police for an anti-burglary campaign. So when we've got it off, Ryan, I think what we should do is take it up there and then go that way down there with it, yeah? OK. Jobs like this can earn Ian up to £1,700 a day. It's one of 370 bookings this year that he says will help turn over £400,000. The business is going extremely well now. We've got a great order book. This is my son Ryan, he's been working with me now for about eight months, something like that. It's fairly low cost labour in the scheme of things. All he requires is plenty of food and he's getting plenty of exercise. So Ian's company has developed since the den. But what of his relationship with James? James and I had a, a series of meetings and discussions on where we could take the business. 
I had put together fairly extensive um, forecasts which meant that we were looking for the £80,000 to actually be in, put into the business day one. James wanted to potentially put the money in but over a longer period of time. When you're building a business, it's not always about today and this month. When I'm making an investment, I want the entrepreneur to really take that investment as the business needs it. And I think with Ian, he was so anxious to say, let's put it all in today, let's add to the fleet, let's double the size of the fleet. I just couldn't agree with that. So as a result of that, myself and Ian won't be going with the deal going forward, but what I have said to Ian is I certainly want to keep in touch with him, and if there's any areas that I can help him in, in terms of introducing clients or customers, would be delighted to do that. So the deal is off with James, but how does Ian feel about his business future without the dragon by his side? What's next? Who knows, but the, uh, the future looks excellent. The business that we've got today is still doing very, very well. Clearly, it would have been fantastic to have James on board as a dragon. Uh, so I guess without, with or without the dragon, with or without James, we're still going to try and attempt to make this business a success. And I'll be a very happy guy in two years' time if we've done what we set out to do, which I'm determined we will. Perhaps James's most memorable investment in the den was also the first, Laban Rooms. If successful today, I would like to run at the franchise throughout UK and Europe. The man whose gold plating business appealed to James's more extravagant side. I like it. Mm. I like anything that sparkles. Mm. Mm. Laban, I'm going to give you the money. So what's happened in their three years in business together? The first 12 months following investment from James Kahn, basically said, like, you know, what are we going to do? How are we going to go forward? And we decided to put the franchise model on hold. And we decided to focus on the brand, selling the products. How's it going, my girl? You all right? All right, just delivering the two gold iPads. It was a whirlwind. We've become number one on Google for gold plating, become number one for gold iPods. You know, most of the terms we're number one for in the world. This one also comes in platinum and normal 24 karat gold as well. Online, uh, turned over, just through the website alone, over £260,000 last year. Retail looks after, like, Harrods, HMV, Selfridges, and that's doing really, really well as well. Today, Laban is hosting one of the brand Discovery Days, hoping to bring new franchisees to his portfolio. This sees a return to the business model he brought into the den. So basically, this can be gold plated on the iPhone, but what we're going to do today, we're going to gold plate it off the iPhone. Really, by popular demand, we kind of saw that people wanted the franchise, the franchise, the franchise, the franchise. Customers love them. Yeah, customers are really happy with, with the results. You know, I started this business basically from my friend's floor and carrying this prototype on my back, knocking at people's doors. All right, keep on looking at the machine. That's, that's very, very good. You can see it's moving, yeah? And I think now, because it's been so developed, anyone that kind of can come on board with us, they, they've got like a blueprint of how to succeed. I mean, if I could succeed, I'm just a, a lovely smile. It's, it's like, you know, anyone can succeed with my guidance. But not all deals that are agreed in the den have successful outcomes. In July last year, Sharon Wright walked before the Dragons looking for £50,000 in exchange for 15% of her invention that she hoped to launch onto the worldwide market. Simply twist them on until snug, align the magnets and push the cable through. She gave one of the most outstanding pitches ever seen in the den. I'd like to say you're fabulous, so I'm going to say you're fabulous. Thank you. I think you've done amazingly well, I really do. And after a bidding war, she walked away with an offer of £80,000 for 22.5%. Thank you. Great well right deal. Thank well you. Fantastic. From a delighted James Kahn and Duncan Bannatyne. I wasn't expecting all five dragons to, to like the product and to, to enjoy what I was telling them. It just made me feel really, really proud. 
In the months following the den, the due diligence process appeared to be progressing well. I got all the dragons wanting to invest in me. If you're happy saying that, I am. Yep, definitely. Okay. I'll go first. But on reflection, Sharon was unhappy with the terms of the deal that was offered by James and Duncan and decided to end their relationship. I just couldn't work with it. I just couldn't work with the contract. And um, so I decided to walk away. Unfortunately, the investment in Magnamol hasn't really worked out. I'm disappointed, but, you know, I've been in business a long time. Not every investment you make works out. Not every relationship you enter into always works out the way you want it. I have looked for investment elsewhere. I was still in the same position. I needed financial support. I also needed the infrastructure and the support to take me to the next level to go global. With a new investor on board, Sharon has joined forces with a supplier to get her product into the big DIY superstores. There it is. There's my little Magnemars. Since we're in Dragon's Den, it's been a stepping stone that I can move forward and, and continue with this in the future. So who knows where I'll be. A partnership that is very much alive is James's deal with David and Patty Bailey from Warwickshire. Their product, an executive computer mouse, certainly caught the eye of the multimillionaires as they looked for a hundred thousand pounds investment. But it was the couple's combined 60 years of business experience that made an impact on one dragon in particular. When David and Patty walked in, I thought, wow, very smart, very professional. So certainly, first impressions in my mind, it was definitely tick that one. What we intend to do is to build licensed, branded products utilising the intellectual property of the motor manufacturers that we intend to partner with. In fact, I came back from Italy on Thursday night and we already have a contract, a licensing agreement with a major Italian supercar manufacturer. The couple have presented an impressive pitch to the Dragons. Having already established links with glamorous brands, they were hoping the quality of the mouse would appeal to the car-obsessed multimillionaires. The motor mouse product was a little bit blingy, a little bit shiny. It just suits James down to the ground. A little Aston Martin or a roller, I can see it now. The thing that I liked about it is that you got it immediately. It's kind of very executive and I can imagine any one of the dragons going for that. The price point for a branded licensed product would not be this $29.99. I would think it would sell somewhere in the region of $35.99, around about £36 mark. I thought we'd absolutely cracked it then. In fact, I thought they were going to be, you know, fighting each other to, to invest with us. Probably the best quality mouse I've ever seen. And I was waiting for the butt. <laughs> <laughs> but the price point for these needs to go way down. Right? What would you way, suggest? Way, way down. I mean, it, it, you, you would have to start selling these at 20 quid, not 30. So you are way off the mark on that. Even if you're with the branded. Even with the branded. Do not kid yourself about the branded. So I'm going to wish you the best of luck and say, I'm out. Concerns over price and market size had forced Theo away from the deal, and three other dragons quickly followed. Only James Kahn could salvage the couple's hope of investment. Everybody was going down what I thought was the conventional consumer. You know, is this a retail product? Is this a retail opportunity? But actually, if you look at the niche market, in niche market areas, I think this market is big enough. So as soon as the other dragons made their positions very clear, it gave me a lovely opportunity to be the only game in town, which, of course, if you're ever going to be negotiating, that's the perfect position to be. I like the mouse, but I don't think it's big enough. But I really do like you guys, and I'm very inspired by what you've done. So I'm looking sort of beyond the mouse, really. I'm going to make you an offer, the full amount. But I'd want 
if that's something that appeals to you, I'd love to make you that offer. When James made the offer, there was a kind of relief that, that flowed through us to say, oh, at last somebody is prepared to, uh, to stick the neck out and go with us. It's a very flattering offer, James, and we thank you very much for that. We are uncomfortable with doing a straight 50-50 split, mm -hmm. frankly, and therefore, would there be any room for negotiation for us to move it so that we still retained a controlling interest in our business? Really happy, so you could own 51%. Okay. Control isn't my issue. OK. So if the control is, is the point, then I'm relaxed. OK, so could we move it to a 60-40 split, James? You got yourself a dip? Thank you. Excellent. Patty and David left the den with that all-important deal. But was James investing in the product or the couple themselves? Clearly, I thought it was a great opportunity for me because I got a bit more than I bargained for. It was a great opportunity for them because they felt they'd negotiated at a level they were happy with. So both parties walk away and we think, what a fantastic result. A year has passed, and while it's still early days for their retail product, this is not the Baileys' first attempt at business. They have long and successful careers as training and sales consultants, so these are not the usual surroundings in which you might expect to find a start-up company. This is a great place, but we tend not to go anywhere. We tend to be based here and things revolve around this place. We do most of our negotiations from here in terms of Skype conferencing. Um, we tend not to leave the office. In fact, we do all our international negotiations and sales sat here. This was the uh, original product that we took into the den, as, uh, as you may recall. Um, and uh, this product um, has been fantastically successful. Um, and we've now got licenses for new products that we're bringing out. So we've got the original um, classic Mini and the BMW Mini Cooper as well. And the Baileys are delighted with sales of the product. Their main source of sales is the in-flight market on the major airlines, selling a reported 35,000 units, and it's all managed from their own distribution base in the garage. Stacey, so, so. um, this purchase order detail that's just come in from Emirates, but what does that all mean in cold, hard cash? Before the den, we had achieved sales for just over £70,000. And uh, by the end of our first year, we are on target to actually generate a million pounds worth of uh, sales revenue, which I can't tell you, I'm just so thrilled about. Just squealing with excitement and the champagne's on ice. Waiting for that moment. Impressive figures for the Warwickshire entrepreneurs, but how much is their dragon backer going to make from the executive toy? James actually isn't going to make a penny out of the success of this. The uh, investment money was made available to us, although we actually found that the business grew so quickly that we were able to finance it ourselves. Um, therefore, we've been able to move with James rather more quickly on to looking at other opportunities of working with him and his organisation in the future. And it's those other opportunities that are exciting James. As usual with these dragons, there's a bigger picture, with the opportunity of an even bigger return. They've proved exactly what I'd seen in the den. And they have, I think, the ability to translate some of their success into other businesses. So collectively, we've now put together a deal where they're becoming my dragons now. So every time we get an opportunity that's similar to where I think Pat and David can, can leverage their expertise, we're now going to collectively invest together and to build a portfolio just like I've got at Dragon's Den. And today, James, Patty and David's new den is opening for business. You all would like to see how this is going. Their first business opportunity? A combined suitcase and chair. It's the sort of thing you might expect to see in the den, but it's been invented by a gentleman you might not expect to see pitching it. I have taken out a patent 
uh, for the special aspects of the design that uh, Graham Herbert has produced. James, so think, what's your gut feel on the price point, having seen it now for the first time? My gut feeling is that you couldn't get more than £5 added to the price of the Roly, so it's a £25 retail product. It's an absolute <laughs> delight meeting you. It's very nice to see you. And you, lovely. Pleasure. Thank you very much. I think one of the things that I'm really pleased with, we've now got a whole strategy about future investments, future opportunities, but more importantly, I think I'm just really pleased that I stuck to my core principles, which is I back people, because it's people that make the difference. Well, I think it's just a year since we actually met James, and now we're sitting in meetings and he's asking us, uh, you know, w w whether it's something that we, we want to jointly invest in. I yeah. mean, it's just an incredible roller coaster of, uh, of, of experience. It's been an amazing journey. The den doors are firmly shut for this series, but James Kahn is a private equity investor all year round, and he recently pulled together a multi-million pound deal to acquire a company that places locum doctors throughout the UK. Morning. And it's taking him back to his business roots. This is one of my recent investments. Morning, guys. This is one I'm really, really proud of because this business takes me right back to my roots. So this is where I started my business career, which was in recruitment. So Jonathan, do you want to just give us um, a quick update on the highlights that have been really captured in the budget? Yeah, um, it's a pretty aggressive budget. The Alexander Mann business that I grew um, was sold in 2008, and that didn't quite make 100 million. It got to 93 million. Um, so I've still got that ambition left in me that I'd like to float a company or sell a business where the valuation exceeds 100 million. Come on, guys, we need to get back on those phones. This is my den. And whenever I walk onto the sales floor here, I mean, it always puts a smile on my face because it just reminds me of, of how I began my career. OK, Lee, let's get this team going. Let's get the buzz going. What I think, James, I think it'd be really good if you got on the phone and show us how it's done. Don't be so ridiculous, Lee. What do you want me to do? So I'm calling Catherine. Michelle, good morning. I just wanted to call you to see how we can help you today with your vacancies. Because I really want to send you only the best. In fact, I want to send you my star candidate. On the phones, 20 minutes, three bookings, £20,000 worth of business. Yes. Still got it. There you go. Peace out. OK. Hopefully on track to sell a business for a nine-figure sum, you could be forgiven for thinking this dragon might look to retirement. But then, that just wouldn't be James Kahn. If I hit 100 million, you know, I'm going to set myself the next goal, which will be half a billion, um, because with me, there's no stop in me. I'm on a roll. It's working, and the world is my oyster. Next time on What Happened Next. My lab is the place where my business career started. This is hopefully the biggest deal for my dish since I came into the den. I have to ask you, what happened? Violent gangs to the paramilitary police. Louis Theroux witnesses law and disorder in Lagos. Next on BBC Two.